really, until you introduce water to the garden, you just can't appreciate what quality it adds to the landscape because it opens up a whole new world of garden plants. There are plants that will grow in the water, there are plants that will grow around the edge of the pool, and with the little shrubs that you're going to hang over the side, you can blend the pool and the garden together. And what I intend to do, a little bit of cheating, is to move one or two big shrubs out of another part of the garden to give me a framework to paint the rest of the patterns against. This is the first shrub I'm going to put in. It's a gorgeous little conifer. It's an old little conifer. It's a very expensive little conifer if I was buying it. I grew it from a cutting. Camisa Paris, obtusa nana. Cut right round the outer rim of the branches. The big mistake that a lot of people make when they're moving a shrub is to take far more root ball than they can lift. Soil is heavy. So make sure you get enough to keep the shrub happy so it really doesn't know it's been moved, and yet little enough so you can lift it comfortably. Make sure before you dig the shrub up that the hole you're going to put it into is big enough. There's nothing worse than bringing a shrub over. It's out of the ground, the roots are drying out. You put it in the hole and it doesn't fit. So err on the side of being it over big. So the roots fit in easily. So the level is just about an inch below where it was planted over there. And then get the boot in. Tread it down, firm it down. It's a big shrub. And the wind will rock it about if you don't get it firm enough. And then gradually fill in with more soil. And that's it. First thing I'm going to do, before I do any more planting at all, water that in. Vitally important. Even though it's the perfect time for planting, water it in. And that's the beginning, the first shrub. Can't get over the enjoyment of that, you know. It doesn't matter how determined I am that I'm going to put the framework in before I do anything else. Suddenly, when I get the framework shrub in, I get an idea. I see a picture. And the picture I had on this particular occasion is of a cotone aster with red berries growing over the rock in front of the conifer I've just put in. The dark green background, the red berries. And when you get a, an idea as good as that, don't think you'll remember it that you'll do it when you've finished all the rest. Do it straight away, because those are the best gardening patterns ever, the unplanned ones. Pop them in so one branch arches back over the rock. And take lots of time over planting. Make sure that you get it right, that you work all the soil down into the crevices around the root. The plant wants to look as if it's grown there forever, which is the illusion you're trying to create. And when you've got a pool, well, you've got to have a willow, but you haven't room for a big one. And this is a dwarf form, Salix retusa. And like the big willows, it's got little catkins in the spring. Important tillers well, they're marvellous because they're in flower for such a long time. And this is a dwarf form called Goldfinger with enormous golden yellow flowers from June till September. And conifers, well, they're so much a part of the winter scene. And this is a Camisa Paris, a dwarf form that'll grow a foot across by a foot high very, very slowly. and the hebes, the shrubby hebes. Well, they flower and they've got the foliage again to give you interest in the winter, like the euonymus. This is interesting if you can plant it against a rock because it creeps over and it's variegated green and yellow foliage against the limestone, lovely. And this is a little creeping cotoneaster grown from seed that was collected in Nepal by a friend of mine, so I had to find room for that. And be very careful not to overplant dwarf conifers. Make sure they are genuine dwarfs, like this one. 
Minima Oreo Variegata. And Antenaria Diawica Minima. The little plant that grows up in the Scottish Highlands in crevices in the rock and looks absolutely lovely. This is the great beauty of gardening, you know. At the end of the day, you look back and you see exactly what you've done. And already the bones are beginning to fill in. Yes, the plants are small, but what matter? One of the pleasures is watching them grow, seeing them creep over the rock, seeing the water provide the background. The plants I've put in round the pool are beginning to grow in very nicely. And this is one of the great advantages of making a pool of this sort. You can plant up the surroundings, you can put in the embroidery if you like, at any time during the winter when the weather's mild because they don't mind. The dwarf shrubs and the little alpine plants and they're beginning to give it a furnished look. You're more limited when it comes to planting up the water garden itself because You've got to wait until the water temperature's got to a certain pitch before you put anything in. No good coming along with a, a water lily and dunking it in deep water in the middle of winter because it'll die. Or it'll get a very severe shock. But now, middle of May, the water temperature's rising, so I can get on. And do what I've been waiting for months to do, to fill the pool, to get it full of plant life. Because when you make a pool like that, you're making a completely new world within the world of the garden. So I'm not only going to have water lilies, I'm going to have marginal plants to hide the edge of the pool. I'm going to have oxygenators to keep the water sweet because remember that if there's things in the pool that are alive, then they're going to need an oxygen saturated water content, not one that's dead, dull and stagnant, which essential that you don't have any decomposing material on the floor of the pool so none of the containers that I'm going to plant my water lilies and are going to have fresh manure or anything like that that is going to decompose and fill the, the pool with noxious gases. And the baskets I use are specially made for the purpose and I line them with hessian. It's much better to use hessian than plastic because with it being open it allows the water to percolate through and that keeps the soil sweet. If you use plastic, the water can't get through into the soil to keep it well aerated. And I'm using a good heavy loam to fill a basket with no organic matter like bone meal or manure because that rots and it gives off nitrogen and it'll turn your water green with algae almost straight away. So, to provide food for the plants, you can buy a special made fertilizer that comes in a packet like this. And when you peel the paper off the top, there's two little holes and all you do is just push the packet into the top of the soil. And the first thing I'm going to plant is a water lily, a frobeli, and that's a fairly strong grower. So I need a big basket. And beautifully packed. So it's up to me to take care of them as well. Mmm. Goodness gracious. <laughs> I've got the biggest basket I could find, but uh, whoa. That really is some root system. Very, very fleshy roots. So be careful you don't break them. The nursery's taking care of the plants in packing and everything else. And make certain, and it is very important this, that the crown of the plant, that's this part, that's the piece where the leaf and root joins, there. Where the tuft of leaves comes out of the root, that is the crown. That wants to be level on the surface of the compost. No deeper, no higher. That's good 
sidle it. No need to rush. Pool took a long time to build. Planting the surrounds, I took all the care in the world with. Can't do the gardener's tap now. That's about right. The crown of the plant is just level. Just sitting on the surface there. Not quite finished yet. Any movement in the water, fish swimming about or anything like that, over the top of the soil will disturb it. By putting gravel on top of the soil, you hold it in place. It keeps the pool cleaner. So, a little bit of gravel on top. Holds the soil in place. My goodness, do you know, I've just noticed something. There's flower buds there. If that doesn't make the job worth doing, I don't know what is. Look at those. Three. Four, if you look down there, that's a flower bud. Hmm. Don't dunk them straight into deep water. The deepest part of that pond's 18 inches. I'm going to start them around the edge. It's like going into a pool on a cold day. You start at the shallow end, and after a fortnight, I'll move them in. As long as the leaves are floating, that's about the depth. And the rest of the water lilies are planted up in exactly the same way, with the crown of the plant level on the surface, and the foot satchet underneath the roots, but not straight into deep water. And beautiful low water lilies are, it'd be wrong to plant the whole pool up with them because no matter how lovely a plant, you can make it look that little bit better by contrasting it with something with a different flower character or a different foliage character. And the water hawthorn is a lovely thing. Beautiful scented flowers, white, with black stamens in the middle. On oh, the most beautiful aroma, they really have. I can see me paddling about in the pool, sniffing all the flowers. Spread the roots out a bit. Remember the magic bundle? Because even though it isn't a water lily, it needs a touch of fertilizer. Spread the roots out a bit. Now, all the plants I've put in up to now, things like the water lilies and the water hawthorn, enjoy deep water. And in my pool, that's about 18 inches. But round the edge of the pool, I've left a shelf. And that's for what are called the marginal plants, the plants that don't like deep water. The planting system is just the same using hessian and loam. But the root systems vary, whereas the water lily had a bud and a crown that sat on the surface. Some of the marginal are what they call rhizomatous, and that rhizome, which is a root-like stem, rests on top of the compost, more or less. And that, instead of planting it that way into the compost, you put it on top. And don't forget, whether it's a marginal or whether it's a water lily, they all get that slow-release fertiliser, the little sachet that keeps them going for a year. Now bring out gravel. That has a, a white flower tinged with pink, and again, is sweetly scented.
And that's got all the plants into the baskets, and I'm going to leave them on that ledge round the pool, what, for about a fortnight? And that's just to let them accustom themselves to the changing climate and water temperature and everything, and then I'll move them into the permanent position. But first, I'll trim away the surplus hessian, because it does make them look a bit neater. And to keep the pool clear, you must have oxygenators. There's no way that that water is going to remain clear enough for me to see the goldfish, unless I put plants in that are going to take in the noxious gases and provide oxygen for the snails and the fish and for everything else that hopefully is going to live in the pool, even those tadpoles. And because there's soil there, you've got to get a layer of gravel on between them between the stems and I checked up on the volume of water in the pool and found that I needed five baskets of oxygenators spaced at intervals down the pool and they don't need any acclimatization I don't need to leave them around the edge of the pool Now, there's one, two, three oxygenators in that end because that really is the deep end. And two oxygenators for this end. And I stick a cane in each basket, and that's just so I know exactly where I've placed the oxygenators in the pool for when I come to plant the water lilies. Don't be worried, by the way, if the leaves that are on the plant die. That doesn't matter. As long as you've done the acclimatization all right, it doesn't matter if the leaves die, it'll produce a new lot if it's happy. The pool, of course, is too deep. Because even though Frobelize had, for well, quite some time, acclimatizing on the edge of the pool, the leaves haven't elongated sufficiently on the leaf stalks to float on the surface if I plunge it into its full depth. So I've got a little trick of my own that I use with this. And that's to get a container that I had a shrub in and half fill it with gravel so it stays on the bottom, frightening the tadpoles to death at the moment. And that's just about the right depth. A frobe light to sit on. See, those leaves are just the right height on the water. You position the water hawthorn in the pool on a bucket in exactly the same way with the leaves just floating on the surface. And before I take the second plank away, there's two other things to go in. The floating aquatics like that, they float on the water. You just drop lob them in like that. Snails. These are, are really absolutely essential in a pool, you know, because they scavenge. If you overfeed the fish, and I invariably feed overfeed my pets anyway, they'll clean up the rotting debris on the bottom. They'll clean the sides, the algae off the sides of the pool and in generally perform an extremely valuable function. They're the scavengers. After being in a mini pond like a polythene bag, they'll the wonder what's hit them. And slowly the pond life is building up and I can't actually wait to get the fish in. And I'm going to give the plants time to settle down.
this is the minute I've been waiting for. I've given the pool time to settle after I planted it up. Now I'm going to put the fish in. And it's a job, you know, deciding exactly what you're going to put into a pool because I want it one or two different sorts. The golden off, because I've always had them in my pools, whatever I've had to deal with, because they are delightful fish. They bask on the surface when the sun shines. I needed some green tench because they're bottom feeders and they keep the bottom of the pool clean. And you've got to have goldfish. What's a pond without goldfish? And then, because I've never kept them before, some ornamental carp, some koi carp. And finally, to give me that extra bit of variety, some shabumpkins. But you don't just come along with a bucket full of fish and dunk them in because the shock of the change from the very small enclosure of a bucket where the water's warm to being dumped in a pool where the water will be considerably cooler could kill the whole lot. So I've given them an hour, an hour and a half, in the bags that they were packed in with the oxygen to acclimatize. And now I'm going to tip them in. <laughs> They are absolutely splendid. It's brought the pool to life. And they're busy now going, like kids let out of school, going round and round the pool. And I won't need to feed for a day or two because this pool is absolutely stocked full of all sorts of pond life. Brought in when we brought the frog spawn in, just to start it off. But they are great. I'm going to spend many, many hours just sitting watching them. Now, this is the great thing about gardening. You have an anticipation. I've had the pleasure of building the pool, and it has been a pleasure. I had the interest of choosing the plants and putting them in, and then the climax of putting the fish in. Marvelous.